Welcome to a new episode of the uh, Bandwagon Podcast. Um, I'm actually surrounded by a, a different setting on if you're watching this via YouTube. Um, so I've been working on this little setting for, for a while now and managed to kind of pull it together. Um, so just a little bit of admin. If you watch the Satman podcast um, via YouTube, um, you might have seen my lips changing colour. Um, I'm going to blame my daughter for that because I had no idea what was going on. She actually put a lipstick filter on and uh, <laughs> that caused me quite a problem. So I did say it towards the end of the podcast uh, last time. Um, but this is just for reference because I did have quite a lot of messages this week going, uh, Rick, what's going on, what's going on. Um, but today um, I'm joined by somebody who uh, I've connected with uh, online um, a number of years ago. Um, it was a time when I was sort of looking deeper into um, Sikhi uh, um, in terms of history and artifacts and uh, relics and just loads of different information, you know, uh, different to the narrative that, you know, you probably see online. Um, and uh, I'm so glad he's joined me today. It's a, a warm welcome to Gurinder Singh, man. Thank you very much, Sasikadi. And um, Sasikadi. Really, really great to be here on the show today. Thank you. Yeah, we were just talking a bit before, um, you know, before we came online of how we kind of had, uh, how we kind of met, but not met really. And, um, uh, and it was just, I was just fascinated by your work, but life circumstances where we didn't just, didn't really get a chance to kind of connect. So do you feel that's a, a bit of a similar thing with a lot of people you meet online? I think the world's kind of changed. Um, either the world's got smaller or either the world's got bigger. And, that, and I'll explain what I mean by that, because uh, you could actually uh, be thinking very globally, which I've always done, and never connect with someone who lives in the next street. But at the same time, there's people you kind of connect with online all the time. And, you know, uh, some people you'll meet in your life and sometimes you will never meet them in your life. But the key thing I think is, is that the world has become slightly a different place to when I started doing research. For this. And, we'll, and we'll talk about that uh, later, but it just shows you how uh, we do live in a different kind of world and how the world has kind of changed to a faster pace as well mm. and how we digest information because that's really, really important because um, whereas, you know, you could spend maybe half an hour, an hour uh, reading a book, for instance, now people want information kind of almost like an instant fashion. Yeah. So how do you respond to that kind of, you know, request, so to speak? But uh, yeah, no, absolutely. It's um, like you kind of said, it's uh, we've never met, but at mm -hmm. the same time, you know, we've felt connected through, you know, various bits and pieces of kind of shown online and the work I've been doing and also the great work that you've been doing over the years as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, connection is not necessarily a physical meeting of people, but also connection of, you know, thinking, great minds think alike. Oh, yeah, I'll also, take that. <laughs> <laughs> and also the idea of where does one person want to go from day X to day Y, for instance, as well, because that journey is just as important yeah. as the output as well, essentially. I think the two words that you just said around connection and journey uh, kind of epitomizes some of your work around it. So for those people who are like listening in or watching in, can you just give us kind of your, 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 um, what your role is and what what have you done around sort of Sikh history and artifact and um, sort of documentation? Well, there's never been a role as such. It's one day kind of like reading up about Sikh history, for instance, and then saying, I want to do something about this. And the question was never about reading and then doing nothing. It was always about reading and then doing something because that's the, that's the most pivotal point of life, are you either a doer or are you just a watcher, if that makes sense? I've, I've always been into reading and research because I read a lot about all the different um, religions of the world, for instance. So before I even went into Sikh history, I was always reading up about you know, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, um, South American religions, uh, you know, the Egyptians, for instance, and history always fascinated me. So in the 90s, late 90s, should I say, is, um, I was reading up a, a few books, for instance, and um, I came about a scripture called the Dasam Granth, which is a secondary scripture 
of Guru Gobind Singh, and obviously we can talk about that a bit later, but that gave me the impetus to kind of uh, enroll onto a degree course here at Leicester at Imopra University and pursue a master's degree in religion, but also in the actual work of Guru Gobind Singh, which is, which, you know, which is uh, defined by the name of the Dasan Guru. So that's where I've got my start. But at the same time, it's all about not just dealing with one piece of Sikh history, because to me, it was always about um, how do we kind of remember ourselves as a faith when uh, there's lots of relics and artifacts here in the UK as well. So how do we equate when um, the Punjab, for instance, was considered to be one of the most richest or prosperous states around probably South Asia, and how the material wealth actually wound up here in the UK as well. So my early days was thinking about those questions and then defining some of those answers over a period of time as well. So it's um, my work has always been about reading, writing, researching, but also outputs in terms of books, exhibitions, dealing with digital technologies now as well. So mm. quite rightly, the journey is just not, one way which you've got to adapt with the time going back to what I just said right at the start essentially so I mean firstly I didn't even know that that course was available at De Montford I knew quite a people at De Montford we're talking 90s now yeah no I was going to say that's a different story in it so we'll just keep back there so um Mm. obviously like uh well not just not just obviously but how do you how do you actually start in, in terms of this because as you as you grow up you're hearing a lot of you hear stories you hear you hear um i, I think one of the things you know having young children myself and uh, you know a large family uh nephew nieces so on um i i think this might be kind of fair to say or probably kind of um controversial in some ways um when you talk to children about Sikhi history um it's almost turned into kind of mythology where people are like, there's no kind of uh, hard facts or people could give uh, information to say these things exist because there wasn't necessarily a lot of visuals around. Um, I, I definitely feel in the last uh, 10 years, you know, you could actually see the, 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 the war where shortage is there. Uh, there she, she hid the, you know, around there. You actually seen, um, different artifacts of Baba Deep Singh. You're seeing all of these things now, which have become tangible evidence that you can show the younger generation. But that's now, how did that start for you in terms of like your starting point? See, that's really interesting. And, it, and it's a really good question because you don't find many Sikh scholars stroke researchers. If you look at it in terms of um, um, the Sikh faith compared with other faiths, we, even now the number of researchers in this field is very minuscule, if you think about it. Um, whether they're professional, whether they're in university life, or whether they're outside the, that kind of professional life as well, it's still very, very limited. So for me, it was basically, well, where do you start with anything? You just go and kind of crack the nut, so to speak. So it's more about resource. Remember, when I started, the internet had just about started. So what that actually means is you had to come very, very strong in terms of knowing research skills or trying to learn these research skills. So I'd already um, done my um, main degree in management at that particular time. So I know how, I knew how to research. So research was always a key pivotal point. In terms of what, how and what you research, it was always a case of, well, yeah, we know things are in libraries. We know they're in universities. We know they're in X, Z, and Y. But then it was a case at that particular time, um, I was just myself and just like contacting people, you know, getting ideas from people. And that's how it all kind of snowballed. The more people you kind of contacted, where the email just kind of was just coming in as well. And the more people you contact, they put you in, uh, in contact with other people. And then that's where the kind of kind of snowballs in, in, in a sense. And I made great contacts with uh, universities in the Punjab in my infancy of my of my Sikh research, for instance. So I was really good to get the help of uh, lecturers at Punjab University, Patiala, for instance. Yeah. So that was really great. And we're talking about great uh, researchers like Dr. George Singh and, you know, and many others as well. So that kind of helped. 
At the same time, it was always pertinent that you've got to do things yourself. So a lot later, making visits and going to the Punjab was very, very imperative. And that's why I've always considered myself to be a field scholar. So that's the difference between, as quite rightly, between a book scholar, for instance. So yeah. a lot of PhDs, uh, you know, a lot of degrees which have done is just based around reading books and then uh, critique, critiquing those books and therefore coming up with some conclusions. I've never been that kind of guy. <laughs> For me, it's always been, you've got to go out in that field. And literally, when I say field, you're going from place to place to see if there could be something of significance, whether it's going to some gurdwaras, uh, whether it's going to some havillians, whether it's going to some battlefields in India. It's always been a case. If you want to research it, try and go and visit it. So you get the sense of surroundings, for instance. And let me give you a good example. Um, when we talk about Guru Gobind Singh, okay, so um, he fought the Battle of Bhagani Saab. I actually went and visited Bhagani Saab, which is, you know, right up in the hills, for instance. And when you actually go there, where the Gurdwara is, it, as, and as with smaller Gurdwara, you don't get that feeling. But when you actually see the fields, you actually see some of the surroundings, that's when you start to understand where the battle would have taken place, for instance. So, you know, you get that feeling only by visiting. The atmosphere, that, you know, you're getting the it, atmosphere. It, it's the atmosphere, it's the serenity. And then if it ties in with, say, you know, with Google Vincent Barney, for instance, it's very historical as well. So you can actually resonate with some of the kind of um, lines he refers to, for instance. So, and I think that's the most important bit is kind of like saying to people, even in 2021, it's not about the internet. It is always about kind of going out there, talking to people, because one thing people don't or fail to realize, we still have a very str uh, strong oral tradition mm -hmm. where things were kind of communicated from family to family, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why um, when you look at the Nahangs, for instance, you know, um, you know, with their turbans and the quoits, for instance, if you look at the way they have channeled their information, it's not, it's not as much as probably other people in terms of actually how they've kind of uh, brought their rich culture to it. That's why their traditions are still maintained. They would say the traditions of the Khalsa are with the Nahangs, which is brought down from the time of Guru Gobind Singh. And the interesting anecdotes you will never find in a book. You have to speak to some of our older generation mm. of individuals and Sikhs who kind of knew and was passed down, this information was passed down. And it's really, really important because I think we've lost that as well with modern uh, ways of actually researching. You've put, many people have forgotten, you know, this kind of connection with the families as well, for instance. And it's really important because recently I've been working and I'll eventually we'll be doing some work on the Sikh missiles, for instance. They were the Sikh confederacies in the 18th century. And I've been speaking to some of the descendants. It's really interesting. You would never get that information from anywhere apart from unless you spoke to them. Yeah. I think that's the key thing here, I think. I think I'm going to try and ruin this out of my own excitement. So what was the kind of, what was the, some of the examples that you've got in terms of when you spoke with the Nihangs and uh, with the Nihangs and families or, uh, or yeah, think, and, and later on? Yeah, I think the key thing is when you talk about with the Nihangs, for instance, they will tell you about practices which they've learned or they talk about. And, you know, when you try and search for that information, say, um, in books, it may be limited. So, for instance, if we talk about uh, the Prakash of the Guru Granth Sahib and the Siri Dasam Granth Sahib, most people would not be familiar with this practice, for instance, because when we go to a Gurdwara, we only see the Guru Granth Sahib. But if we talk to the Nahangs who have been custodians or have that kind of uh, information and culture which has been brought down from, you know, from the 18th century, then you actually get the surrounding information about, say, the Prakash of, of two grants, for instance, and which doesn't kind of fit in with the modern or Singh Sabha based idea of how Sikhs are supposed to represent themselves. But it's these little anecdotes that you will pick up. And let's just take, for instance, speaking to the descendants of the, of the Sikh missiles, for instance, they will tell you about uh, family uh, relics and artifacts that they have in their custody that being again coming down through the ages from you know a couple of hundred years ago and and stories related to that as well and the key thing 
as a historian for myself is connecting the dots. It's not about one piece of information. People get hung up and say, this bit of information happened in, I don't know, 1830, and it's so significant. I'm not into that kind of game. I'm more into, well, if that happened in 1830, what else happened at that time? And how can we create a greater picture of putting that one fact or that nugget in perspective? Because I think that's the key idea. That's why it's more almost like a storyboard when it comes to history. It's not the event, it's the surrounding events which takes you to that particular point, essentially. Mm -hmm. So you got your degree now for, you know, we're back at De Montford. Um, and what was your, what was your first projects that, uh, that you, you undertook? I think the first thing was, because um, the work I'd done was related to the Dasen Club, I'd started writing a few articles, for instance. Um, I mean, from when I finished in 2001 for a couple of years, a bit, I was just kind of just doing other kind of research, if that makes sense. Yeah. But then when I started writing the article related to the Dawson Run, even the British as well, um, the British relationship with the Sikhs. And, and this is going back, you know, some time ago. I know mm -hmm. we released the book recently, but this relationship I was researching way back. So it's these kind of uh, articles that I wrote for a um, kind of magazine, which is actually published in India called San Sabai. And that actually increased this kind of understanding for, or sorry, this kind of um, uh, queries from people because uh people are saying well who's this girl this man in the uk who's yeah, but that? I, that's a good point actually because like you know your appearance is you're the same as me you're a modern you're it, it, this how how were you i mean you're modern now i don't know actually back then so <laughs> i'm just saying did, did you ever find any kind of the, the, those stereotypical battles uh, you're always going to get that because um, when you talk about Sikhs who are Amritari, for instance, and some who aren't, there will always be that, oh, is there some kind of mistrust here because you know, yeah. you don't, you're not appearing to be of, you know, of, that, of that particular kind of ideal, which is always an ideal as well. Firstly, I want to correct you on this idea of a mourner. That word does not exist. There's no such thing technically as the word mourner. What we had uh, from the early 1800s, sorry, sorry, at the time of Guru Gobind Singh onwards was uh, Khalsa or Stairsbari, mm -hmm. okay? So the word Stairsbari means you're a slow adopter, essentially. So as people were beginning, beginning to become Khalsa, there were Stairsbari, so, you know, you'd be growing the beard and uh, you wouldn't be cutting your hair, but you would not be Khalsa as well. This modern idea is an actual corrupt way of actually disowning or disconnecting uh, Sikhs who are not Amradari from their roots, essentially. It's, it's very derogatory term, mm. essentially. And it shouldn't be used, and it's absolutely uh, um, it's not the best way to encourage people to become the car side. Like, if, if I may say that. Yeah, yeah. But, so the yeah. so in essence, the language is the the language that have been utilised in modern day sort of uh, terminology is is also going to be playing a huge role in terms of how we're going to move forward, and especially writing the story from 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 the past. Uh, absolutely. So therefore, going back to your question. Um, um, I've always had great love from people from all um, uh, spectrums, really, from the Sikh faith, um, coming down from the Jathadars of the Akal Takht all the way to different seminary groups like the Dumdumni Daksal, for instance. And so we, you were talking about some of the greatest kind of groups and the highest uh, orders here mm -hmm. in Sikh authorities, even from the Nahangs, for instance, and going down to the, your local Gurdwara, for instance. So it's I've always had great love because a key point here is it's the output again. What, uh, why are you doing this? If you're doing it for a reason which is not in tune with Sikh values and therefore, you know, you're just one of those individuals, then, yeah, you're going to get caught out regardless of what you look like and, and what kind of ideas you kind of preach. But if you're actually furthering the, the religion, if you're furthering the faith, if you're kind of bettering not just yourself, but bettering everyone's education is a win-win-win. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some people have always kind of said like, well, at the end of the day, um, if you're going to go and, you know, you need some health advice, are you going to look at what the person looks like? You're going to go to a doctor, yeah? Mm -hmm. You don't know what they're going to look like. You don't know what they're going to prescribe. And in the same vein, if you want to come and meet a real Sikh scholar, 
you know, you've got to come to where, where the history of the fact <laughs> That's it, that's it. So you, 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 you've, you've written some articles, you, you've started the way. What, what was the particular interest in, uh, of, of the Dustin Grant? And what was the key things that you learned from, from, from that? I think when, uh, like, like I said, in the 90s, for me, it was more a case of everything all the same. The information is all the same. The books I'm reading are all the same. So when I pick up this book um, by J.D. Cunningham called The History of the Sikhs, in, in the back is an appendix. And in the appendix, he talks about the dust when Pasha Grant. So, uh, you, know, the, you know, the grant of, you know, the 10th king, basically. And I'm like kind of confused thinking, well, hold on, I'm going to the good one. I'm, you know, we kind of bow down to uh, the Guru Granth Sahib. There's only one grant, etc. So this kind of challenged that idea. So it kind of brought me to this journey in terms of actually doing the research for my MA as well. But then it was more a case of um, there was a lot of um, polemic arguments going on. The Dasam Grant is created by Guru Gobind Singh. And then the other side is the Dasam Grant is not created by Guru Gobind Singh. So you've got this polemic argument going on. It was very confusing because really that's not how you kind of resolve an argument. It has to be facts by the end of the day. So to make sure whatever I was going to do with regards to uh, the Barney of Guru Gobind Singh had to be by factual information. And the factual information had to come from the earliest manuscripts the 18th century sources and practices as well. So for instance, if Guru Gobind Singh writes his words, are they written on any other kind of item? We call this material heritage. So for instance, so Guru Gobind's Bani is written on swords, for instance. It's written on his jarena. So just to explain that jarena is a Persian word for four mirrors, which is a breastplate. And again, I talked about the Bhagani Sahib, which Guru Gobind Singh writes. So the Bani of Jab Sahib Kalas that is inscribed on that, together with the Bani of Guru Granth Sahib as well. So the point here is, in order to kind of research and factor in everything you're doing, you have to look at it from not just a history point of view. Because when you look at, um, people ask you, well, what's the meth methodology you use to come to a conclusion for something? But if you use several different types of inquiry, then it's got to be and then it's got to be watertight essentially. So, so that's how I came to the conclusion that uh, Guru Gobind Singh Bani was written by Guru Sahib, was prescribed by Guru Sahib, and the grant was created by Guru Sahib during his lifetime. Now that was really important because you know, there's a lot of kind of rhetoric saying that it was. Um, by Mani Singh, uh, the pious Sikh and the great confidant of uh, Guru Gobind Singh had, had um, kind of found a various kind of um, leaves of the pages of, of the Granth and, and put them together. And that was never true because we've got dated manuscripts going from the time of Guru Gobind Singh, uh, for instance. And again, people will deny that. They say, no, 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 it doesn't exist. But these are all facts. These are all been corroborated. It's not just me saying this. Other scholars have looked into it as well. But the point um, I'm trying to make is that in the main Sikh Guam or the kind of diaspora, there was all this kind of... Um, uh, it started early 90s, even prior to uh, for me researching Dasam Grant, but there was all these polemic arguments, and it got really nasty as well, where, you know, uh, people wouldn't speak to each other, and it's almost threatening behaviour on both sides, both sides, let's get it right, on both sides in terms of whether you believed in the in the Grand side or not. Um, and it's, and the Akal Tahsab, you know, the highest authority, deliberated and said, yeah, um, we should always venerate the, uh, the Dasam Grant, whether people want to put it on par with the Guru Granth Sahib, that's, you know, that's optional, essentially, because what the Nahangs do, or various things that took place in history don't take place now. So for argument's sake, I talked about the Prakash of the Guru Granth Sahib and the Dasam Grant used to take place in all the Takhts, so let's get this right. So we're talking about the Akal Takht, for instance. Mm -hmm. We're talking about um, the uh, Geshka, uh, sub uh, in in Anantapur sub. We're talking about Patna sub, where it still takes place. We're talking about Hujur sub, which it still takes place in Damdama sub. And we've even got a list of the Gurdwaras where this took place. However, that does not mean that uh, we should now um, add the Dasam Granth 
through the Guru Granth Sahib in every Gurdwara around the world. A, people will not accept it. People don't even understand it. See, the, the problem here is, if you don't understand the Guru Granth Sahib, how are you going to even understand the Dasan Granth? Because the Dasan Granth is a higher level of knowledge which Guru Gobind Singh is trying to take you to. So once you understand the Guru Granth Sahib in terms of, you know, references to sometimes Hindu mythology as well, what Guru Sahib is doing in the Dasan Granth, he's actually kind of um, making or enlarging the level of knowledge that one has. That is done through his personal journey and talks about um, his lineage, for instance, in the Bajeta Nata, for instance, but at the same time, he's talking about the worldwide view as well. So whereas we talk about various Hindu deities like Krishna, Jandi, Guru Gobind Singh places himself in that cosmology of gods and goddesses and tells you where the Sikh faith fits in. And most people can't understand it because of the fact that you've got to have an open mind. And if you don't ever have an open mind, you're never going to get to the kind of conclusion that you really require or does require, essentially. Mm. I mean, I mean, it, it, there's, there's many different angles to go, go down in terms of this sort of the speech. I mean, like, to even... The depth of knowledge in the Guru Granth Sahib is, you know, I, you know, I, I don't even know a minuscule of it. Um, in, in the depth as well, and then having this, the function of the the, the Dasam Granth is is a bit different, wasn't it? So who, who that was aimed at the 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 Khalsa. It was almost like a source of power for the Khalsa. And I, I know that in one of your lectures you were talking about how the British really researched this. Um, sorry, I was speaking to somebody actually. They were talking about when the British came. And looked at they they actually studied the Sikhs in quite a, a level of depth and realized that the kind of Dasam Granth was a kind of a source of power. Would, would you was that a fair say a safe way to say, uh, talk about it? Absolutely, because this is the difference you see. It's because when we talk about Sikhs being Sant Safai, which means you know um, Saint Soldier, the Grants also represent that as well. So the Guru Granth Sahib is a saintly Bani. And the Dasan Granth is the warrior Bani, essentially. Because um, if we look at Shastra Vidya, for instance, Shastra Vidya is the martial art of the Sikhs. And you recite the Dasan Bani before you go into battle. Okay, so the, that's already kind of a connection is there made in terms of like the spiritual and the martial, for instance. But that's not to say you shouldn't be reading the spiritual before you go out to battle as well. Now, interestingly, there's a Ratnama, for instance, and I can't remember which one, which talks about, I read Jopi Saab, which is part of Chittapakyan, before and calm my mind before I go into battle, for instance. So the idea that what the Dasam Granth represents is, because we do have Banya like Jab Saab, for instance, which is part of the daily Nitnam, which is the daily reading of, Bani in the morning, for instance, so and various other uh, times as well. But Japs are people actually equate it with being a very, whilst it's uh, done as part of the Nithanam, uh, when we do the part, it's actually a martial Bani because it's talking about some very swift kind of maneuvers. So, Namastanga Gal. So, you know, when you're talking about uh, the different names of, of, God. of God, for instance, and Agal Purk is done in a really, really swift way. And interestingly, it's written in something what we call shuns. And these shuns actually represent almost things like a snake, for instance. So you've got these certain kind of words coming out, which actually are supposed to be crisp and really, really fast. And it actually represents wielding a sword. And it goes over people's heads because they don't realize it's a martial Barney. It's supposed to be read in battle and it's, you know, complements Japji Saab, for instance. So, and it's these kind of little things which we find in the Dasam Granth, which is not just lost on people, but is not understood if you read the Granth in its, um, in situ, if that makes sense. You've got to understand the Dasam Granth in, in the idea or the or in the same way as the Guru Granth Sahib, but also the idea of the martial as well. So that's why um, it's always considered the secondary scripture of the Sikhs, but also complementary as well, because that's why you have the Nithanam, because you wouldn't have the Nithanam if you didn't have both Shantabani and the martial Bani. 
combined. That's it stands to reason. That's why it's all about know, it's so in essence it's a complement it's a com uh, it's complementing each other in terms of the conduct of what's going to be happening. Absolutely, and the key point is there's no point in being martial if you've not got the spiritual head. Mm. Yeah, and and that happens and has happened with various kind of martial orders in the world as well. So even if we look at say the Shaolin monks, for instance, it's considered to be great warriors, but they're very spiritual. All they're doing is doing their spiritual meditation. But when it comes down to that fateful time of, you know, attacking and being part of armies, they're the strongest. Mm. And that's how it works. And it works, it's worked with various kind of uh, dharams all across, all across the world as well. So that's kind of the key. Now, just going back to what you said in terms of the British and how they understood it. I mean, it, 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 there's been different shades of how the British have viewed uh, the Dasam Granth and how they've viewed the Sikhs as well. And maybe we'll come on to that a bit later, but that, that's interesting in itself. So uh, you, your work led you to kind of put, put, uh, to write a book um, um, alongside with the uh, Kamal Roop Singh, was it? Um, and how, how did it, what drove you to write that to the book and what were the key, the key things that you learned in that book? Well, interestingly, this, I've written two books on the Dasam Granth. However, the first, the second, sorry, the second book was supposed to be first, okay. <laughs> if that makes sense. So um, I'd already wanted to write the book on the Dasam Granth because it was needed. Um, so the book, which came out second, was going to be published with Oxford University. So which was a great kind of thing as a first book, technically, to be published by Oxford University. And, you know, many people in the UK, for instance, even scholars as well, have never been published with Oxford University and probably never will. Um, so it was a great kind of thing for them to have accepted myself and Dr. Kumarup Singh as well. So I met Kumarup Singh when he was doing his PhD in the Dasim Granth and we kind of pooled our resources together. So the idea was to actually do a academic book uh, with Oxford University. However, due to the time it would take, we thought we would kind of release a small kind of book uh, related to 50 questions and 50 answers called the Siri Dustin Grand Sahib Question and Answers. Because the key thing which myself and Gobra Singh were getting was, what's this, what's this? It's the same questions that came about. So the idea was to write a book to answer the same questions we were being asked a million times every other week, if that makes sense. So, so whilst the secondary book came out, the first one was already doing the rounds in terms of actually explaining about the basic Barneys, what's the Barneys for? In fact, some of the questions you've kind of asked me as well, but mm -hmm. in a nice, easy way to kind of understand. So 50 questions, 50 answers. And to this day, you know, people are still asking for it and people want it because they just want a nice, easy way of actually understanding what the city doesn't run Saab actually equates to. So, and whilst that had been released a couple of years later, the more academic work, um, so the first one came out in 2011 and the second one came out in 2015. And during that time, the following was there for people to understand the academic work as well, because that went into much depth. It went into depth because it went much more into the scripture side. It went into like the use of relics as well and the understanding of Guru Sahib's relics and what it means. Um, and also an understanding of, of the Khalsa as well. How does the Dasam Granth actually equate with the Khalsa? And that's why the academic book really takes uh, people on that pedestal and on that journey, which was really, really kind of what people were missing because it, like I said, a lot of the arguments was polemic, um, which is like either the Dasam Granth is written by the Guru or not. We kind of answered that in the first kind of um, chapter essentially, and then moved on to the more important ideas about the Dasam Granth and how they're represented. And I think you know that's the key thing because you can either go round about a subject round and round all the time and never, and that's why some of our communities sometimes fall into the mud, what we call the quicksand of history, which is like, you're just in the same part, but you're never moving anywhere. You either move ahead 
or you're either going to stay the same. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of historian who wants to move ahead. So, you know, had to take a different way of kind of approaching the subject. Essentially. So you were coming from it from an evidence point based uh, view to say that to categorically try to close some of those arguments in order to discuss the further arguments from uh, from then. Is that right? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's really important because it was almost like with the secondary book, it was like you're closing off the arguments that I could talk about by Money Singh um, not being the creator of the Dasan Ram, but more of a compiler later on, for instance, and various myths that the Sikh community had completely got wrong about the Dasan Ram and how they'd got it wrong as well, because it's really important to tell them why and how you've got it wrong, and also more about um, the factual information as well and the historical information as well. So for argument's sake, we talk about the Prakash of Guru Granth Sahib and, and the Sikh Dasan Ram. I've also went into evidence in terms of when the Prakash used to take place at the Akal Takht, for instance, and how important it was. And, you know, so this evidence and information is really important, even during the time of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, how, you know, this kind of practices used to take place. So if we've shed a lot of practices, say from 1920 onwards with the formation of the SGPC, it's important to go back and say, well, how and why this took place to kind of lead you to the kind of that conclusion of why, you know, the work of Guru Gobind Singh is maybe not understood respected or probably understood in the same level as the Guru Granth Sahib. I think that's really, really important. So how, how then was it, how was the books being received? Um, like I said, I think the books, both books have been received uh, re really, really great. I mean, the, like I said, the question and answers, because it's a much simpler book is, you know, it, you know, every other week someone's asking for a copy, for instance, yes. um, you know, that will never be ending. The, the, the academic work is in virtually every library around the world. But the important thing about the academic book is it was it had a lot of proofs to in favour of why the Dasan Grant was created. And interestingly, we're in 2021 today. OK, book was written in 2015. What's that? Six years. Yep. We've never had one rebuttal on the book. I don't think I'll get that many viewers anyway, so I think you might be safe after this one, <laughs> But the point I'm trying oh, but, to... Yeah, it, I, think, I think it goes back to what you were saying from the evidence base, mm -hmm. that you were going from so many different sources that it was watertight for you to actually kind of, when you, when you put it together, it's very hard to co come back with a response if, if the evidence is there, because... Yeah. In, in any kind of uh, in any kind of debate, you say, "What's your best evidence?" Mm. I'll give you my best evidence. Yeah. And if it's not there, the other, and the reciprocating party, then it it doesn't move. But the problem is even worse than that. The problem has always been with the kind of youngest faiths on the planet. If you look at it in terms of the major dharms and the major yeah. religions, so you could not have lost anything within the three hundred years. When I'm talking about, you know, 500 years, if you're going back to, say, Guru Nanak's time, you cannot lose that information. What that means is you've lost it because you've either the language skills have gone downhill, which is very true, because a lot of things were written in Persian, 18th century, 19th century. And also, um, we've, not, we've not been great record keepers ourselves, for instance. So therefore, like I said, there's been a very really big oral tradition where things have come down as well. So it's really important that when you are sh uh, shifting through evidence, it's got to be really kind of watertight, like you said. And, you know, um, 2021, you know, um, never had a Javal. And all these people for years and years, even now people say um, about and poor scorn of uh, Guru Gobind Singh's Bani, but, you know, it is it is what it is. Um what you you talked about being kind of the field scholar and the difference between the, a book scholar and and a field a field field scholar do you feel like you're both now <laughs> <laughs> well well look, look a book scholar you always have to be you cannot yeah. uh you know do research and you can't kind of do anything without books the whole idea when i started the journey was you actually are researching books to give you that information so you can go out in the field if that makes sense the oral tradition gives you that idea in terms of going out in the field as well because you hear a story or you hear an anecdote which says that a grant is at this particular 
um, house or at this particular Gurdwara, for instance. Because remember, um, whilst we equate um, the grants and even relics as well with maybe Gurdwara or even smaller museums in India, um, you know, a lot of items of interest are actually kept with custodians, like I said, with um, you know, descendants of families as well. So, you know, and some of these people will never show uh, what they've got to most people because the problem has always been is their fear of theft. They don't know who outsiders are going to do if they come and show the if, if they come and, you know, they show these items to individuals. And, you know, this has happened in the past as well, where some kimti, very, very expensive, very interesting items have disappeared just by the fact that people realize where items are kept so i understand why uh, collectors well not collectors as such but custodians oh, yes. of artifacts don't want to kind of reveal but um it, that's where the importance comes from actually having great kind of connections what people giving you know almost like letters and saying look this person's okay and you know it's for research purposes only because without it you, you're never going to get to see half the things on the planet what, what was the what was the key what was can you just give us some examples of some of the key things that you've that you've managed to see in the discoveries well, well yeah, I mean, the key things are some of the oldest grants uh, available. So I've seen the Grant Sabs, which have been kind of signed by Guru Gobind Singh. So from the time of Guru Gobind Singh, we talk about the Guru Grant Sabs, which he's personally signed for. And so that's one of the um, key kind of items which I've kind of seen myself. Um, um, early Siri Dasan Grant Sabs, Sarups, for instance, um, that's been really, really interesting. Um, relics related to um, the missile period, for instance, say Baba Deep Singh, for instance. I mean, some of these are kept at the Akal Takht, for instance, as well, I'm going to talk relics, but mo most people never get to see them, for instance, um, because they're only shown on certain occasions. So it's been a mixture of uh, Sikh manuscripts, you know, relics and artifacts. Some have been in private collections, which I can't even tell you um, the amount of different kind of things I've seen. I've seen the vase of Guru Gobind Singh and Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib um, in private collections, for instance, from families which go back a couple of hundred years, for instance. So I think I've been really blessed to have um, had the dashan of these items. But at the same time, you know, uh, even going out to museums here in the UK and working with curators and, and museums, I've been able to see things which are never on display. So that's been really, really important as well. And I think that's... Um, would they, would a kind, a kind of like testimony over two or three, you know, over two decades of work, and just being sincere as well. It's not about the item per se; it's about how, how, what the item connects to with other pieces of Sikh history. I think to me, it's always been that connection again. Going back to what we we're talking about a little bit earlier. Would you, would you, would it be fair to say that there might be an argument to try and bring all these things together into having a, a central function or a, a Sikh museum? I know that's a, a, the kind of work that you're looking at, but do you ever see a time where it's all in one home? Well, yes and no, actually. Uh, the, well, the way it works is that, well, my organisation is called Seat Museum Initiative. So we work with a lot of museums um, on the ground, essentially. So, you know, we get to see a lot of items. And we've also created the world's first 3D museum as well, and we can go into that uh, a bit later. But the point here is by having a central repository of Sikh items in one place. So let's do a little bit of a history lesson here. Yep. The first Sikh museum actually opened in 1999 in Leicester. We had the first, because I'm, I'm from Leicester, so yep. we had the first Sikh museum, and, and that was opened by the Queen. Most people don't know that. It's opened by the Queen. And... Um, and in this particular museum, there was more manuscripts. So there was like Bharat and Sarups uh, of different kinds of writings. There was Guru Granth Sahib, Dasan Granth, and other writings as well. And there was like pictures and um, various other things. Well, not much on the artifact side, but that started in 1999. It went, uh, you know, after the funding had died down, it, it went it went basically so that is that was the end of that we've had we still do have a museum in derby for instance called the Sikh holocaust museum and that works in its own way the majority of items of interest there are Sikh cannons for instance there's other things as well there's there's a there's an art gallery as well however the biggest challenge has always been to have a great repository 
where all some of the greatest artifacts are in one roof in the UK. Now, the thing is, it's always down to cost, for instance, in order to have a museum, we're talking about a million plus in terms of money what's required. People will sometimes have scoffed at that when I've actually told them how much money you need to make a proper museum. I'm not talking about a building which you kind of just kind of half-heartedly convert into yeah. something just to make something really world-breaking and something which incorporates digital technologies as well and incorporates, because the thing is with museums is um, they're not against people loaning items you know you can, you can loan items for an exhibition as you've got insurance for instance you, you can get items from from the museum so when we did our uh, exhibition on the anglo seat walls i worked with about seven eight different museums across the uk and we got the loans and we did an exhibition on the anglo seat walls in leicester it was a great exhibition but you know it's you've got to give a you've got to give the museums a reason why you want to actually take out those it those items from their museum in order that it gives kudos to that museum, but also enriches the subject as well. But let's add another caveat to that as well. We have a lot of uh, private collectors here in the UK as well, and they've amassed a, quite a wide range of artifacts as well. And the ones I've been speaking to, they'd be kind of very open to kind of loan their items um, to a central repository as well, if it came down to it. But one day that may happen or it may not happen. But the problem I always seen um, is that you shouldn't do things in halves, for instance. It should be kind of really, really planned out properly. You know, you should have the best kind of um, acoustics with, within the building. You should make sure that, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's got the security, for instance, but also it's the interpretation as well. So you're not just got um, like you were saying earlier on about when you look at Sikh history, for instance, you hear about all these things and it sounds like mythology. Yeah. You want to create that historical interpretation on the object so it's actually understood in a wider context as well. So the answer to your question is one day I hope there is that in the UK. It doesn't have to be in London. It could be anywhere in the UK. And, you know, if I can help in that endeavour to do that, then, you know, we, we would look to do it and help in, in, in that thing. If anyone else had that budget or had that money. Yeah, it just, it, it, I mean, it's, sometimes it just doesn't make, it doesn't make sense why in some areas that people got money for Padake, yet you know, it's something that from this side of stuff, why haven't yeah. um, various kind of councils or boards or come together or individuals kind of come together or has there ever been active fund uh, fundraising for this? I've never Forgive seen... My, my naivety on, on this bit i'm just trying to you know yeah, yeah. No, no, uh, my no, own no. Um, i've always said sometimes there's no such thing as a bad question if you're asking it in a genuine way yeah yeah <laughs> so, I, hopefully this is coming out genuine <laughs> very, very genuine um no i think i've never heard it in a kind of um from an organizational point of view in terms of actually let's get a seat museum off on the ground on a local level, I've tried to make, I've made attempts to try and do one in Leicester once or twice. Uh, again, it's just hit a few hurdles, but only for those particular reasons of, you know, resources, basically. Um, in terms of expertise, expertise is not an issue. The artifacts are not an issue. People normally, the normally the issue is getting the items into a, a museum so it can frequent it and be so rich and it be so important that people want to come and visit it. That's the easy part from my point of view. The actual resources to actually kind of fund something is, like you said, it's not the difficult thing. It's just not been kind of done in a way which it should be or should be done now. There's no reason to say um, there shouldn't be one started tomorrow. But, you know, it has to be done in the right way. And it also, like I said, has to get, you've got to get the interpretation right. But yeah, quite rightly, um, unfortunately, sometimes the community doesn't focus their resources in the right direction. And, you know... I don't think... It, I, I think it could be, in essence, in terms of, like, it's not known. It's like, people... Are, how often do people have these kind of conversations at homes? You know, I'm sure, especially nowadays, the way that we've talked about online and how the, the world's getting smaller if there was a genuine plan put together, I, I'm sure it would gain some kind of momentum. I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear the arguments to kind of refute it. Um, but I just, you know, I, I, I think that maybe the time is the timing is now or, 
or, or definitely soon? Well, you know, I, I, all I'm going to say, let's hope so, because, you know, um, we live in an environment where in the UK specifically, um, kind of the kind of inhibitions with museums is, is a lot less than it was, say, 10 or 20 years ago, whereas, you know, items could not be seen or they weren't that forthcoming. Um, I mean, with the concepts of decolonization, with the Black Lives Matter movement last year as well, and with some of the um, you know biggest kind of organizations like the National Trust and various other institutions now really kind of saying, look, the doors are open for kind of research. There's nothing stopping us from doing that. There's never been anyone stopping us from doing uh, doing these kind of things anyway. But I think the, you know the impetus is a bit more better year on year if that makes sense because you know yeah. the momentum is more in favor of doing something positive but yeah no absolutely it'd be, it'd be a great thing to see so i mean i mean it's good that we, you know we're talking about the kind of the uk the uk and the sikh history has always been sort of entwined over the last say 200 years especially 250 years um you you've you've written your 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 latest book uh which goes ar around that can you just tell us the story of why that came about and um, and, and what it led to. See, it's interesting when you asked me right at the start about what I was researching, when I was talking about the Dasan brands, I was also looking at British sources at that particular yeah. times as well. And interestingly, uh, one of the first books, apart from the Cunningham book, which I mentioned, was a book by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Malcolm and, he's, and his book on the Sikhs as well. Yeah. And he's actually, and it was interesting because I read it and I read it and I read it and I read it and I read it again. I was thinking... I can't find anything wrong with this book <laughs> because it's written by someone from the, and I can't find anything wrong with it. So Wait, were you looking to find something wrong with it? No, it was more a case that whilst I've been reading other books by the British, I was like, mm, yeah, some bits aren't right. Some is all wrong. Cause if I compare Cunningham's work, for instance, there's some errors, which I've saw straight away, but Malcolm was an eyewitness, which means, so when he came to the Punjab, you know, around about 1805, he's chasing a Maratha leader into the Punjab and he's there, he's speaking with Ranjit Singh, he's actually speaking to other people, he's talking about, he's talking about the Nahals, he's talking about the Guru Granth Sahib and the Dasam Granth on both levels as well, you know, on the same level things, he's talking about the Prakash. So all these things I'm kind of thinking, well, it's interesting because later on, when we come to 2021, it kind of gives you this idea that there's always been different shades of how the British have viewed the Sikhs, if that makes sense. And that's why I wanted to push this kind of boundary as well. So when we live here in the UK, most British people kind of equate Sikhs with, you know, you know, with Sikhs in the World War, for instance. OK, World War One, maybe World War Two, And they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we know about Sikhs. They fought in World War One. They fought with us, etc. Um, I want to go a bit earlier than that. So. I'll talk about the Anglo-Sikh wars in the book, for instance. But then I thought, I'm going even earlier than this. So we get to the Ranjit Singh period. But then I thought, let's go even earlier than this. So it, it, was four, it was four sections that I, I that I saw in terms of how you had it, in terms of like just after the, or just before, soon after the death of Guru Gobind Singh Ji. Absolutely. And then and then it, then it come, then you have the relationship between the the missiles, and then you have in the relationship between the the Nahangs and the and the and the and the, and the British, yeah. and then kind of going off to like from the you know probably the the full integration really of uh, and the, the the colonization of india so so this is the key point you see the idea that you know we're talking about um, seats in in the world wars is just like a little bit of information. I mean, I didn't even talk about it in the book because I stopped mine at 1900. Mm. The idea was to talk about right from the time of Banda Bahadur's Shihidi. So it's, an, again, an eyewitness um, of somebody who actually witnesses the execution of uh, Banda Bahadur. And it's important because this is where this kind of idea of the East India Company coming into India and actually having some good records in terms of how they viewed various kind of cultures um, if that makes sense. So they were culture vultures, essentially, you know what I mean? So uh, they came in, they documented everything, so they wanted to know about things. And that was very, very early, if that's, that's a very early anecdote. And then, you know, a bit later on, I want, what I wanted to do was I actually wanted to talk about how, so on my cover of the book, uh, I've got Baba Bagheel Singh, so he's a Sikh general, um, he's a leader of the Gora Singha missile, and he dominates Delhi in 1783. 
But I want to actually kind of give that kudos to the fact that the Sikhs weren't just these kind of individuals who uh, are just warriors on horseback all the time. I wanted to kind of prove the point that there's diplomatic links between the Sikhs, Delhi, so we got um, you know the Mughals, and the British, which is far removed from both these locations. Yeah. And the idea that the Sikhs aren't just a, a warring band of you know bandits essentially, or you know they're just kind of a rubble of individuals, just you know, with 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 um, with swords. The idea was that. The Khalsa, created by Guru Gobind Singh, was given this kind of form and given this depth and this understanding and this level of communication as well, because that's really important, because people say, well, we don't know what happened in the 18th century. Well, we do, actually. It's just that people just haven't dug uh, enough to find where this information has been. So it's really important to kind of show that the British had a problem with the Sikhs prior to... Um, them raiding Delhi because the British were looking at raiding Delhi as well. They wanted to get their stranglehold in Delhi, but the Sikhs had got there in 1783. Uh, the Marathas were already there, the, you know, um, and other groups were there as well. They've got the Rohilas were, were there as well. So you've got all these individuals trying to take over Delhi or have a piece of the pie. And the British were like, well, who are these people now? So they've got these Sikhs. But the thing that the British gave kudos was that when um, Abdali of the Dur Durrani Empire had come and kind of, you know, done his kind of massacres all over India, um, Robert Clive, so Clive of India, he makes this important point. He says, as long as we have the Sikhs in the north and is combating uh, Abdali, then the British, where we are, we're going to be safe. The only thing he thought was that the Sikhs and the you know, and the Dharanis and, you know, the um, the Afghans would make a deal and that yeah, would then, in, in, you know, and then impact on British interest. That wasn't going to happen, but that was just that mind process. And going on from there, we get the different governor generals who start talking about the British. And it's interesting. Look, we've got just something Alawalia, you know, head of the Buddhadal and, Dal, you know, and the Dharandal, and he's actually writing letters to the British. And these are letters of friendship, I'll call this friendship in inverted commas essentially, because the idea here is that the Sikhs were communicating with the Mughals, with the Afghans, with every group that's out there. And this is lost on people in this day and age because people think um, that dialogue is not important. You've got to have dialogue in yeah. some form or fashion, whether it's good or bad, it's, you've still got to have that communication because how are you going to know about these groups? I just it was um I just had to take a I had to take a, about a minute out really when I was tr I I couldn't believe that there was the British around at the Guru Gobind Singh Ji's time it or just uh, so shortly after I just couldn't in my in my version of history I never kind of positioned them at there it logically makes sense because of what eventually happens but I never knew the start point mm. Well, the charter was given, you know, uh, around about 1600 for yeah. the East, uh, East India Company to come into India. Obviously, you know, they grew and grew and grew. I mean, the 1750s, um, you know, Battle of Plassey, for instance, that's when they're kind of zenith of the British. That's when their ascendancy really took place. And it's interesting because as the, uh, the British Empire, if you want to call it that, rose, so did the Sikh Empire. It was the same trajectory that they were following. So they were about to meet at some particular point, if that makes sense. What I was trying to get across in the book also was that about territory as well. So we talk about Punjab and we talk about the regions, you know, below the subtilage. We talk about regions above the subtilage. And unfortunately, uh, what's happened is that most people only isolate their ideas to the Sikh empire. So the Sikh empire was so big. Mm -hmm. Maharaja, did, Maharaja Ranjit Singh did so great, which he did. However, the border of Sikh uh, estates, okay, was all the way up to the River Jumna. So the River Jumna is far removed from the River Sutlej, for instance. And the Sikh estate also went all the way around to Dili, all the way to Awad. We're talking about another river away mm. where the Sikh interest lay. And yet we only think about the Sikh empire from the time of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. I personally feel that the Sikhs had larger territory 
in the Sikh missile period because what happened was when there's some Jatta, so to speak, took place between the British and the Sikhs, anything below the river Sutlej was British territory. And this took place early on in Maharaja Ranjit Singh's uh, tenure because he was still young. He was still trying to understand how this empire was going to form. And he couldn't have so many battles at the same time. So that's why he's kind of forced in a position. But he did make a mistake as well because the Sikh missiles uh, were like the Kura Singha missile, Shahidi missile, uh, we had the Bungi missile there as well, or parts of it were all around the river Jumna. And all these territories, so we're talking about Patiala, Naba, Jing, Kalsia, these, all these uh, places, and they all had empires of their own. Mm. At, at the same time as Maharaja Ranjit Singh, they were all Rajas in their own right. The reason why Patiala didn't want to side with Maharaja Ranjit Singh is because. Well, firstly, they were always kind of on their own anyway. They always did what they wanted to do. There was like whatever's in their self-interest. But the others can't be accused of that because it was their hegemony. Hegemony means they wanted to keep their own status quo. And Maharaja Ranjit Singh was encroaching on their territories. So if someone comes down to your house and says, I'm taking your house, but I'll give you £500 a month, you're going to be thinking, hold on a second, what's this all about? So the Ranjit Singh's problem was to actually kind of have that friendship with these Rajas, so to speak. And he was unable to do that. But in the meantime, the British were able to kind of, you know, uh, because oh, they were, they were so, so close, you see, because Dili's here, the Jamunas are not too far away. So the, and they were very small uh, Rajas as well, if that makes sense. So they knew that even with those six, seven, eight uh, areas uh, banding together, they'd struggle against the British. Whereas in the missile period, say in the 1780s, that wasn't the case. So within about 20 years, it had gone more in the British favour as opposed to the Sikh favour. So what Raja Ranjit Singh should have done was keep a border force around the Jamna, and then that may have made a difference in terms of how Sikh territories would have been over a period of time. It's just my uh, kind of thought process yes, when you look at how far the missiles have gone all the way over India. So that's why the Sikhs aren't necessarily a Punjab thing. It is a generally northern Indian phenomena, uh, per se, really. I, I, I did have uh, Hawinda Singh uh, Mandir on, um, who does the Sikh Education Council, and I asked him a particular question around the Punjab and Sikh culture. Are they a separate thing, or are they uh, are they together, or is it kind of infused together? And he believes that they have always been kind of entwined together. Do you feel that's something that? Do you feel the same way? And he, because he, we, he, in a long way around, we kind of he he went back to say that the Sikh culture and the Sikh identity started to get diluted, especially around Maharaja Ranjit Singh's time. Is that something that you've found in evidence in, in your line of work? Uh, I disagree with that because the whole idea is that dilution isn't about a person, if that makes sense, because mm. uh, the missiles period was different, but even they, when they were on the decline, so if you start looking at the late 1700s, um, you could see that um, you know it was more of a hereditary thing as opposed to a religious thing as well. So Maharaja Ranjit Singh had consolidated the missiles, okay? If anything, the dilution wasn't there. In fact, Maharaja Ranjit Singh actually strengthened um, the idea and the cause of, uh, of Sikhism you know, because he was given patronage, and for the first time in history, there was stability as well. So the Gurdwara, for instance, were given money on a regular basis to maintain, you know, um, I might be doing it. Yeah, I might be doing a disservice to her in there. I think it was more about at the time that there was poets, the arts, there was a whole explosion and it never necessarily kind of carried on after that. That Okay, so then that's then what the issue there is, that is post annexation. And so we're talking about mm -hmm. 1849 when the British actually take over and where that leads to, because, yes, we did have a renaissance period where we had you know, poets and we had the artisans. And if you look at the grants as well, they were actually nicely decorated as well, start getting decorations in the group, grants up under Dasamba and Janam Sakis as well. So you get a different take on. And so we do get this blend of architecture in the Lahore period and the Lahore Durbar as well. We actually have uh, people like Lena Singh Majithia, um, who actually is a Sikh scientist, who's 
are inventing things for the Sikh Empire. He invents a sundial, for instance, which we can still see within Harmandasar, which he created. We have um, an art, again from Lena saying, but also a European inventions merging with Sikh inventions as well. So when Maharaja Ranjit Singh employs the Europeans in his army, it's a fusion of Sikh and European ideas. It's not just simply a certain idea comes into the Sikh uh, empire and that's, it's, it's kind of embedded, it's kind of just taken over per se. It's blended and that's the beauty of when one culture meets another, if that makes sense, because you're going to try and try and fuse these ideas and try and come up with a better idea, which comes out to, you know, two uh, cultures meeting, essentially. So why did you stop then at, 90, at the at the 1900? Is it because there was a... Um, actually, I'll let you answer the question why he stopped. <laughs> well, I thought uh, World War One and World War Two people know things about... about yeah. Know, know about, but it's not true either. Um, because even if you look now, there's still a lot of ignorance that's related to... Um, Sikhs in the British Indian Army and the World Wars as well. I mean, we've had comments from certain individuals who have said, well, you know, we look at films and then people have said, well, there's no one of, you know, of brown colour within the, the armies, for instance, and went quite categorically there was. So you've got these big films, and I'm not going to mention them all, nor I'm going to mention the individuals who've said these comments, but they get taken to task because even they're unaware. So these could be very big figures, um, whether they're kind of actors or, or whoever they are. But what you've got to remember is this kind of um, relationship that the British and the Sikhs had is very, is, it is very military based. So if you're from, if you work from a military pro, uh, profession, and even if you're in a military profession now, you are going to know who the Sikhs are because it's part of that kind of blend of ideas. Interestingly, um, I make this very, very interesting comment, which during the, during the um, mid 1800s, a newspaper came out called the Illustrated London News. And they used to report from, you know, all around the world, but they used to report about the Anglo Sikh wars as well. So when the Sikhs were fighting uh, the British. And interestingly, we were in the columns every other day. Mm. In 2021, we're not in the columns every day. No. So the British knew about the Sikhs more back then than they do now. Yeah, I think that's what that's what we were talking about with like how they kind of researched the Sikhs. So they definitely to know what the they knew. It was more, you know, from a military point. It was a more kind of a, an angle. A, 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 that's what the sense that I got from your book in terms of that it was very carefully prepared, you know, attacks that was going on, and it was the fate of circumstance that actually helped them a, a, a lot, lot more. You talk about the relationship with the British and 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 and, and the Sikh. Do you feel now that it's getting becoming more fractured? Especially if you look at if you look at the relationship from partition, what happened and the role that the British played within there, and then afterwards, uh, I think you're going to have to ask everybody that question individually because yeah. it's very very individualistic. You've got different kind of uh, thought process here going on, and people respond, and there's different ways of answering that question. My view is always this: the British uh, that was in charge of say uh, partition. Is not the same Britisher who fired on uh, Gillian Malabarg. It's not the same Britisher who's actually kind of um, employing individuals in the British Indian Army. It wasn't the same Britisher who was fighting during the Anglo Sikh Wars. It wasn't the same Britisher who was friends with Ron Dranjit Singh. It's not the same Britisher as part of the East India Company when they started. They may have had the same trajectory, but or their goal may look the same, but it is very, if you break down each event, are we talking about? The British, or are we talking about a certain individual who was British, if mm. that makes sense, who was the cause of such a thing? I mean, partition, if we talk about the individual who did, who drew the line, basically, so yeah. rapidly, he's just like, he was a cartographer, a cartographer person who deals with maps. He was given a certain amount of days to kind of draw this, that, and the other, and come up with something. If you give somebody that kind of task, that's what you're going to wind up with. Yeah? So, yeah, and you're, fair enough, people may question the policy and how quickly uh, partition was undertaken. Dillian Malabar, different kind of set of events, how, of how that took place, even though it was, a, it was a big massacre, but is it the individual who's at fault or is it the whole uh, kind of, uh, what's it called, the, the regime, so to speak? Mm. So um, the idea of fracture depends on who you speak to, essentially, because if you're living here in the UK, you're born in the UK, and you're working in the UK, and you know you've lived. Your family has been given a haven 
say in the 60s that from a father, you know, your, your grandfathers mm-hmm. have come. Um, the relationship is both ways as well. How do uh, a community or a religion or a resource, how do you project yourselves with, within a community as well? Do you talk to your neighbor? Friends? Is it your neighbor talking to you? Are you, um, are you reaching out to individuals as well? So it depends on various levels. I personally don't think there's such thing as a fractured relationship. I think there's probably a misunderstood relationship at times, but at the same time, it's up to the individual to also uh, get rid of some of these myths that may be associated with certain groups as well. What individuals are doing? So I think it's, it works both ways. I mean, there's so much work to do um, left to uncover from an earlier period, which I'm still working on, if that yeah, makes sure, sense. Because sure, I've sure. kind of worked backwards and forwards. So I worked on Guru Gobind Singh and, this, uh, and you know, the gurus. And then I worked on the anglo Sikh Wars, uh, the uh, the British and Sikh book has talked about the um, the Sikh Empire. My next book, called The Rise of the Sikh Soldier, talks about the same items again, going from the Missile Period, um, Sikh Empire, um, Anglo Sikh Wars, but in in more depth, basically. So the main part, I think, in terms of Sikh history, which has been is underrepresented, is the Missile Period, and that will probably be my focus over the next couple of years essentially so is there any way that you're talking about that happening in uh, how would you how would you do this that, that book different to some of the areas that you've already kind of covered it would you be utilizing some of the digital technology information that you've got into it how, how would you be taking a different approach i think uh, when it comes to the seat missile period like i said to you before um I've, I've kind of made links with descendants for instance so that would be the better way of actually capturing a lot of information because that's been the most underrepresented area of Sikh history uh, from, from the time of Guru Gobind Singh. We have plethora of information from Ranjit Singh's time, the Anglo-Sikh Wars to some extent, British Indian Army uh, to some extent, World War One, World War Two. The Sikh missile period, it's virtually kind of extinct. You look for any books on the Sikh missiles, one or two. <laughs> That's about it. You'll have individuals like Jasa Singh Ramgaria, Jasa Singh Alawalia, you, you, there's no there's no major book on Baba Bagheel Singh, no one's ever written one, and some of the other missile leaders as well. So therefore, what you find is that there's a big gap, and the gap has to be um, kind of uh, covered up, covered with Persian sources as well. So I've been digging into a lot of Persian sources, which um, to kind of reveal what was taking place. So I've got that on kind of a, a research kind of idea. But like quite likely, I said, um, the idea of tapping in with descendants is so, so important because that's the gold mine of information that you will never be able to get from books, going back to what I was saying at the start, start of the when do, you, when do you feel that part of your, that these projects will be kind of finished? Well, um, the Rise of the Sikh Soldier book is due out in 22, uh, early early period of 22. The Sikh Missile peri- uh, book, uh, I'm not so sure because there's still a lot of work to do. I've written probably 100 pages already, but uh, it's, n- it's only touching the surface in terms of where I want to go with this, if that makes sense. Because Would you, would you do audio books on it? Uh, audio so, so the way it works with publishing it depends on your publisher if that makes sense so yeah. um if they have that outlet for a book to be created in, in in that format it's up to the publisher i don't actually physically think about is it going to be an ebook is, is it going to be an audio book but quite rightly uh, most people have said maybe your book should be turned into um, audio books as well because some people have said well i prefer not to read but i prefer to listen to things it's not yeah. something I, I do, but p- other people say that. I mean, obviously with podcasts as well, like you're doing as well, it's really mm. important because you can you can listen to them. You don't have to be physically sitting somewhere. You can you know, listen or watch things anywhere, basically. So, yeah, it's definitely something which in the future, which may appeal and, and you know, as we go more digital, is more and more important as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so th- th- this is called the the bandwagon, um, and this is a, an opportunity which I give all my guests in terms of: is there anything in particular that they want to raise, or um, you know, as you come into a podcast, is is your opportunity to get something off your chest? Is there is there anything that you would like to get off your chest? 
there's a million things I like about <laughs> Chelsea. But I think the key thing for me has been, it's not necessarily about myself, it's about how you actually empower other individuals as well. The younger generation, and I have been kind of a little bit, kind of um, a little bit cheesed off to say, you know, there's not been many people who have followed either me or followed other individuals in the UK who've done great work in history and heritage. And quite rightly, it goes back to well, where do I start uh, yeah. kind of thing. And, you know, you would have thought by, you know, since I came about since the late 90s to where we are now, there'd be probably 10 of me or 15 of me or 20 of me doing similar kind of work, but it's never been the case. And all right, um, you know, we as Indians or we as Sikhs feel that, uh, you know, we should project our families towards the professions or whether they should be working towards doing something which is um, X, Z and Y, which relates to some, you know, financial compensation. But yet later, when people have made their money 20, 15, 20 years later, they think, you know, I don't know anything about my culture. I don't know anything about my religion. And that happens because the parents have told their children that you should not do uh, um, history degrees, for instance. You should not work in that particular field. There's nothing to say you can't do both. You can't be a professional and do research. You know what I mean? It's like um, it's this idea of that when you've done your nine to five, you come home and you watch EastEnders rather than you do your nine to five and you read a book, for instance, or you would like, you know, um, look at digital technologies, for instance. So what I'm trying to get off my chest is that um, I think the guidance that we have to give our younger generation has to be given in that dosage where, if we don't, then you're going to repeat the, the problems we've had for the last maybe two decades here in the UK in terms of articulation. Because if the Gurdwara is the only place where people understand about Sikh faith and culture and history about the Barney, then, you know, you're missing something else. Because when I went to the Gurdwara when I was a child and I used to look at the different paintings of the Shaheeds, for instance, it really painted out the fact that we'd always been persecuted, which ain't true. Mm. We've had an empire, but how often does that get uh, kind of reflected? How often does that get taught? How, why are we not talking about some of the positive things that the, the Sikhs have done over millennia, rather than actually always uh, talk about the idea that we are Sheeds? Yes, there always will be Sheeds and the blood spilling out Sikh veins, but what about the positivity uh, of that? What's the, where's, how do we turn the screw, if that makes sense? And these are the stories which are really, really important. So we talk about um, the great Holocaust in Sikh history. Now, 1984 talks about, we call it the, the third uh, Vada Gulagara, or the third Gulagara, which is the third Holocaust. But the first and the second Holocaust in Sikh history, when we talk about the Vada Gulagara, you know, we're talking about nearly 30,000 Sikhs dying in one day over a period of, of a couple of days, which is almost like, you know, a certain huge chunk of the Sikhs just disappearing off the face of the planet. And did the Sikhs actually say, oh, we're, you know, we're, we're now galams of the Afghans now, we're galams of the, the Mughals? No, within six months, the Sikh missiles hit back. And this is the important lessons we have to learn for the future, which is if something happens, how do you go about readdressing it? Okay, during the missile period, it was, you know, you take the Dalvar, you take the swords and you're gonna fight back. There's different modes of address in this day and age. And if you do not have that dialogue, then you're always gonna be in that position where, you know, certain communities, certain governments, even, you know, if you're talking about the Indian government are always gonna be away from that table where you can have that dialogue. And it's important because I've showed you in terms of the Sikhs having, you know, in the book, I don't go about it too much, and I'll probably talk about it a lot later in the missiles book I'm talking about. But the Sikhs used to have vakils. Vakils were like, you know, almost like their kind of own solicitors, their own kind of representatives in the courts, for instance. So, you know, if information is flowing, it's flowing everywhere. You had to be part of that court to have any influence. You could not just say, well, no, I'm not going to speak to this person because they did what they did to our people. We would have never have got anywhere. Yeah. 
So, you know, these are the kind of uh, things which, you know, have over, you know, over X amount of years kind of made me think that, you know, we're not taking the lessons from our past, which we should be, uh, in order to further, you know, advance the community, essentially. Well, as a history master, I, would, I, would expect, I wouldn't expect you to say anything different from learning your lessons in the past. No, um, no, thank you, Gurinder. I really appreciate, uh, you know, this this conversation. So uh, how do people get in touch with you if this is an area that they want to get interested in themselves um, and to kind of move their own kind of careers forward in this area? How do they get in contact with you? Um, I've got my own website, which is called Seek Scholar, uh, www.seekscholar.co.uk. We have the movement called the Seat Museum Initiative, so they can contact us through the social media channels, websites on there as well. And, you know, we, uh, prior to the pandemic hitting, uh, we were doing like over like 20 kind of events a year. So we still do events um, online as well with, um, you know, doing online webinars, for instance, and when things start opening up again, we'll be doing a lot more events as well. So come and see us, come and speak to us and, you know, be part of the movement. Don't just be a, a, a passive kind of person, which, yeah, I like this. You know, I'd rather not have anyone like me on Facebook, but rather actually say, well, you know, I've seen this lecture or I've read this book and I want to do something about it. You know what? I'll delete my social media account but I'll go about and do some research. To me, that's more important than actually, you know, going about actually getting the kind of, um, the kudos. The kudos is great when it comes from individuals and the, you know, you're getting respect from individuals and your peers in terms of what you're achieving, but it's important for individuals to take some responsibility as well. So, you know, come to the websites, you know, come to our events, for instance, and hopefully in the links um, that you post up as well, you know, yep. I can, we can we can send people out to where they should be going Definitely. next. Yeah. Right. So, so thanks very much to you as well, Ranjit. And, the, and it's definitely a great show. I like some of the artists you've already had on <laughs> as well. So, you know, so the bandwagon is going from strength it's to strength. Moving. Yeah, it's, so, it's, it's, it is moving. It is moving in that. It's moving forward. So uh, it we'll, wouldn't we'll be a wagon if it wasn't moving. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. Well, thanks, Grinda. Cheers. Appreciate right. it. Thank you very much. Sashigal. Sashigal.